Hello, and welcome back to Rewildology, where we explore conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I'm your host, Brooke Mitchell-Norman, conservation biologist and world traveler. Before we get into today's episode, I wanted to give you all a little sneak peek into some big things I've been working on behind the scenes. First, I've received an increasing number of requests for merch, which I did not expect, but I'm so excited to hear. And I'm so stoked to let you all know that I'm partnering with the amazing designers at Studio Half Calf to put together some really cool stuff for you all. I don't yet have a date for when the store will be launched, but I'll keep you in the know as things develop. Second, and also super exciting, I've also been hearing about the need to elevate the Rewildology experience, and so I'm so, so, so incredibly excited to drop a hint that I'm working on a premium feed to bring you all kinds of extra content, goodies, interviews, stories, Q&As, and so much more. I've completely fallen in love with this podcast, and I want to put everything I have into making it the best experience for you. Shit is getting so real, people, and I'm stoked to get to know you all on a more personal level. Okay, I'm done with the teasers, and I'm ready to introduce you to today's guest, Jeff Trollope. The only way I can describe Jeff is that he might be the most interesting man in the freaking world. (laughs) Those that keep beer should definitely reconsider their spokesperson and hire Jeff, which actually might be pretty cool to get a major beer brand into the conservation sphere, but... Let's work on that. Maybe maybe all of us together can make this happen. <laughs> Anyways, Jeff was born in Scotland, raised in Southern Africa, studied in the UK, and has spent his 20-year career guiding safaris all across Africa. Since he has traveled and met so many people, he's become very entrenched in the conservation scene and has some incredible stories about what he's done and seen to restore national parks in Mozambique, Tanzania, and more. He recently launched his own conservation-focused safari company and built an insanely cool adventure-style safari camp. Just wait until you hear everything he's put into this experience. I could barely sit still in my chair. I wanted to hop on a plane so badly to see this thing in person. Jeff is currently in need of a name for his new camp and would love ideas from you. If you think of a creative conservation-minded name, reach out to me on Instagram at Rewildology or email me at hello at Rewildology.com and I'll be sure it's shared with Jeff. Jeff is based in Arusha, Tanzania, and most of our conversation is related to his work in the country. If you're liking the show, please hit the follow button and share with someone you think would enjoy this episode. Sharing is the best way to help the show grow. All right, everyone, here is my conversation with Jeff. Thanks so much, Jeff, for coming on. I'm so glad that you're meeting with me all the way over in Tanzania. And I'm yeah. actually in Southern Ohio right now in the U.S., so this mm-hmm. is great. Um, but on that note, since I'm where I grew mm-hmm. up, yeah. so let's chat about your childhood. Where are your roots? Mm-hmm. Uh, what was what was it like for you mm-hmm. growing up? I'm not sure how long this podcast is. <laughs> as long as you want it to be. Yes, it's quite a long complicated <laughs> story. Um, yeah, so so I originally I originally was born in Scotland, so a family of Scottish, and I left Scotland at three years old, uh, so packed my own bags and left Scotland. Uh, no, my family moved, and I moved <laughs> to to Zimbabwe uh, for a small amount of time, and then to South Africa, um, where I went to school in South Africa till I was maybe thirteen or fourteen. And then went back to the UK, parents moved back to the UK, and I finished most of my schooling in the UK. Um, while I was in the UK, I had a very, I was studying and had a, a few weird jobs at that time, one being a landscaper or landscape laborer. So I basically shoveled shit. And yeah, went that's pretty much and, what that means. Yeah, yeah did, did, did jobs other people didn't really want to do. Um, so made enough money at the time to do a trip back to Africa where myself and a partner at the time, we got enough money together to buy a really crappy old Land Rover. And the idea was to drive from from South Africa back up to England. So yeah, that was the plan. Uh, we we kind of we kind of got halfway there. We uh, we got to South Africa. We we got a really clapped out old car. I'm surprised it went as far as it did before it died. Um, but yeah, we we went all the way up to Ethiopia, 
Um, then we were young. I was only I was only seventeen at the time. Uh, seventeen. She was eighteen. And yeah, we ran out of money. We didn't know what we were doing. So in Ethiopia, we had a bunch of calls going out to say friends, family who can help us get back down to South Africa <laughs> because we can kind of make it. Um, so yeah, that that was the great the great African trip that didn't happen. But uh, well, it did happen. But it was only only half of it which that half still took five months. Yeah, I was going to say, like, how long did that take if you're going all the way from South Africa to Ethiopia? Like, that's not, that's not a short uh, distance. <laughs> it, it, it's a long way. It's, it is a long way. I mean, you can do it in a, in a fairly short space of time, but we took five months. We just explored and had a lot of fun. But anyway, why I'm telling the story is that on this trip going up through Africa, I met a lot of very, very interesting people in various game reserves, in various national parks, in various conservation roles around Africa. Uh, and a lot of them left uh, left quite a big imprint on me that said, well, I want to do that. So a few people in particular, um, who I'm still in contact with now, run various conservation programs around Africa. And I was like, well, I really like what you guys do, and I want to be part of that, and I want to do it. So, so yeah, I made it happen. Um, I met someone who was a game warden uh, in North Luangwa National Park. Um, that's ideally what I wanted to do. I wanted to wear khaki clad clothes and run around the bush and uh, look at animals and, and save shit, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, it was as, as, as basic as that as a 17 year old. It's like, it looks cool, I want to do it. So I, I got back to South Africa or went to England and then came back to South Africa and then started studying. So I was like, whatever I can get my hands on, I want to study. So I started studying ecology at a university. Uh, unfortunately, ran out of money to finish the studies. So I didn't. I had to get a job. So the job I got uh, was a guiding job. So I went to a, a, a company that did guiding or had a guiding school. And you would guide and then you'd work at that company, which I did for a few years. Um, this was in northern uh, South Africa. And I, um, yeah, became a game ranger. Um, what was called a game ranger, now called a guide, and worked there for a couple of years and then decided to study more. So I became the person who trains guides to be guides, if that makes sense. Yeah, so yes, if yes, someone like wanted to be guide. a guide, yeah, exactly, exactly. So if someone wanted to be a guide, they would uh, come to me and I would assess them and then we'd go from there and basically qualify them into being a guide, which is cool because it took me all over the place. So I then went from there to uh, Namibia, from South Africa to Namibia, where I started training uh, guides or game rangers in Namibia. So I ran around Namibia for another two years or so. And then back and forward with, with national parks in, in Southern Africa. So working in Botswana, working in Zambia, uh, basically moving from place to place, guide training, guide training, uh, getting people to understand how to take clients out on safari. So nothing really involved in conservation yet at that point. So I was taking a lot out of uh, um, wildlife, to speak, and I, I didn't think I was doing anything to, to kind of you know, do any good. You know, I was taking really wealthy people out on safari, and, and I mean, there's some good in that, but Basically, I was making lodges uh, wealthier, and you are protecting a certain area because people come on safari, yeah, but I wanted to do something a little bit more. So a point in time came where a friend of mine told me about a park in Mozambique. So there's a park called Gorongosa National Park. Have you heard of it? No. Mm -mm. No? Okay. I know. It's, I it's... should, but... <laughs> no, I know, no, I didn't so should. Well. I was like, ah, actually, I don't know. Keep going. <laughs> it's, it's it's not that 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 common a park. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, not a lot of people go to the park at all. So there, there's actually hardly any visitors that go to Gorongosa. That is that is changing now. But so what is the other... ecosystem like? What is this park like? Just so I'm trying to. I'm a very visual person, and I've been to yeah. Africa so many times. So like, what is this? What is this park? I'm glad you asked that because it's actually one of the, the most aesthetically beautiful parks I've ever been to in my entire life. Oh, and I've okay. been to many, many <laughs> parks. <laughs> and it is one of my favorites, or is my favorite. So, so Gorongosa ecosystem is basically based around a massive floodplain. So there's Mount Gorongosa, which is not actually 
it's part of the park, but separated by villages and community land. And then you've got Gorongosa National Park, which is just over 3,000 square kilometers. You'll convert that into miles for me. Uh, and <laughs> it's, um, yeah, totally controlled by, by the seasons. So in the wet season, the, the lake, which is the lake called Lake Urema, basically quadruples in size and takes over maybe a quarter of the park and then recedes back in, which, which creates amazing, amazing aesthetics, like palm trees, which where you were going driving in a road a few season, a few uh, months before, now you were taking that same path or that same road in a boat, going through palm trees and watching elephants slide through the palm trees and with, with knee high water. Oh my um, God. <laughs> yeah, a unique, unique, unique park with a, with a pretty terrible history. Yeah. So Mozambique has never been the most most uh, stable country in Africa. Um, so there was a civil war that lasted a very long time in Mozambique, uh, where over a million people were killed. Uh, and basically for the reason that there were two factions, so Renamo and Falimo, which are still in existence today. Falimo is the party that, that runs Mozambique. Renamo is the rebel party that was created by Zimbabwe and South Africa, um, because they basically didn't want a black-run president or black-run country next to them. So that's oh how it God. all started. Yeah. So, so they basically funded people to go into Mozambique and, um, and train soldiers and destabilize an area and make them fight against each other. And so that's, that's a, it's a lot more complicated than that, and someone who knows a lot more about it would tell you more. But that, that's basically the premise of why a civil war started in Mozambique and lasted a very, very long time. And the epicenter, or the, sorry, the headquarters for the Renamo rebel base was Gorongosa National Park. Because it had a really, it's a bushy area, it's uh, easy to hide. There's a large mountain with caves that you can do arms caches, which they still think they're arms caches there today. So it had a really, really turbulent history and the animals took the brunt of it. So the mm -hmm. wildlife in Gorongosa took the brunt of, of the war um, in terms of just catastrophic losses. So everything that was there was almost entirely depleted. Um, and it used to be a very famous park. Like John Wayne went to that park at a time. Really? Uh, Buzz Freaking Aldrin John went to that Wayne. park. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, so in, in the day, it was a really, really, like, fancy place that people would go. Back in, like, the 60s, it was, uh, it was like, oh, where are we going? We're going to Gorongosa, this massive big safari in Mozambique. It was the place to be. And then Civil War happened. Everyone forgot about Gorongosa, and everyone forgot about the animals that were there. Um, until an American philanthropist came along, uh, a guy called Greg Carr, uh, he made his money in, uh, in the tech industry, in the mobile phone industry, a lot of it. And he decided he wanted to put his money to good use. And he flew over a number of parks within Mozambique and I think wider Southern Africa um, and decided on, on Gorongosa uh, to start helping. And you can, you can see why. If you flew over 100 parks in Africa and you flew over Gorongosa, you would also have the same feeling. Mm. It's it's pretty special. It's really really special. So anyway, that that that's that's kind of the history of the park uh, up until I got there. Maybe and that was what eight years ago or so. Um, where yeah, I got an opportunity to go in and help in the park, basically to go help in uh, uh, train rangers in the park for tourism purposes, which then over the next four years. Uh, changed to a number of different activities. So it changed to one, anti-poaching. So figuring out how to protect the animals that were getting taken out. And I mean, animals getting taken out by the truckload, okay? So not all of Gorongosa's animals were, 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 were gone. Uh, the major ones were, so, so elephants were almost gone, lions were almost gone, uh, wild dogs, leopards, those kind of things were almost non-existent. But there were a lot of plains games. So things like waterbuck, Funny enough, Gorongosa actually has the highest concentration of water buck anywhere really? in Africa. Yeah, because of the floodplains. So the floodplains are a massive part of the, the ecosystem, and water bucks thrive on floodplains. And it's really hard to poach things out on open floodplains. So those are the animals that actually survive better That's than true. any other animal. Yeah. So so there's still a lot of animals to poach, and a lot of lot of a lot of it was meat poaching. So you would have poaching camps where they would they would set snare lines and gin traps, really nasty, nasty gin traps, where yeah, 
tons and tons of, of bushmeat was taken out. So yeah, we part of the restoration project of Gorongosa that Greg Carr started was trying to figure out how to curb the poaching in Gorongosa, which we did. We did was quite this effectively. Was because of um, the like the turmoil? Was it just not enough food? Is that what it was? I, like this was just like for subsidence? Like I need food. Yeah. Well, th this is after the turmoil. So mm. so this is okay. after the war. But remember, a war leaves a country a country completely devastated up for a long period of time. And unfortunately, the area that 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 Gorongos is in is Renamo still. So Renamo now is a political party. It had very bad beginnings because of how it was uh, constructed, but it's now a political party in Mozambique. So there's Frelimo and there's Renamo. Frelimo is the government at the moment. And Renamo is still, those are still Mozambicans in that area that unfortunately fought a war against Frelimo. But they have not received very much support because they're the opposition. Mm. So that whole area, the Safala province, has not received any support for a very long period of time. So people are poor. People are really poor, and protein's a really hard thing to come by. An extremely hard thing to come by. It's fertile soil, so things grow, but protein is a very hard thing. And yeah, so that's that's what fuels the bushmeat trade. So, so we needed to figure out a program. We needed to figure out <clears throat> how to equip the rangers with what they needed, how to form patrols, how to stop it, the, the poachers being inside the ranger force. It's a whole long program that, that started with that. And that included funding not only by Greg Carr, but, but getting people to know about the park. So we had a lot of really cool people come to Gorongosa. So I don't know if you've heard of, of someone called Edward Wilson or E.O. Wilson. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so like the modern-day Darwin, uh, mm -hmm. he's actually he's a proper legend. So he came to, to Gorongosa uh, and set up a lab. So, yeah, there was a few films that we did, and uh, he was really instrumental in, in kind of putting Gorongosa on the map a little bit more. Wow. One for scientists and then for a bunch of other people too. Um, so the E.O. Wilson lab is currently working amazingly well in Gorongosa. Uh, there's very few tourists that were going to Gorongosa, but there were a huge amount of scientists and researchers. So the researchers actually took, took the role of, of, of tourists in the park. Oh. So like, here is a really interesting research topic. Take an area, take all the animals away from it, or well, most of them, most of the keystone animals, and then see what happens if you protect it and what comes back first, and, and in which way they come back. So yeah, researchers loved it, absolutely loved it. Um, yeah, and, and the park has been getting better and better and better and better over the last, well, I think since Greg Carr has taken it, it's probably been 10, 11, maybe 12 years. Yeah, probably 12 years now. Um, reintroductions of wild dogs, uh, which is actually a very similar thing to, to reintroduction to wolves into Yellowstone National Park. How uh, we're starting to see changes in the environment and changes in, in the actual landscape due to bringing a predator back in, or well, the start of them, not quite yet. Um, hippo reintroductions, elephant reintroductions, uh, lion reintroductions, swapping animals from, from areas that were hunting areas, or are hunting areas in, in uh, Mozambique. We have a lot of waterbuck. We swapped with what they have. So we did a big swap of elant and waterbuck, um, which is really, really great. And it's a, it's a proper success story in Africa. You hear a lot about things that are really not working in Africa, and that is one of the, one of the greatest success stories that, that has come out of Africa in a very long time. Oh my gosh, I have so many questions right now that are like boiling out for me. Like, oh, like, I want to know all the things. So ask, ask I guess away. first, first, um, mm -hmm. I don't even know what first. I have so many questions. Um, okay, first, I'm going to go my geeky science side. Please, so please. for for the reintroduction of this wildlife, did this yep. did, was this from other African countries? Was it a natural? Mm -hmm. We just to see like these. Were these populations already in Mozambique? And like you said, just to see what naturally comes, was it a mix mm -hmm. of both? But how did this wildlife even know that this place was safe to come back to? That's good questions. Uh, and a few questions in one there. So a lot of the, the, the keystone animals had to be brought back in. So things like elephants, the genetics of the elephants had gone down quite a bit. So there were still elephants in the area and elephants are actually really good at staying alive i know you wouldn't seem it wouldn't seem so when you hear on the news how many elephants are actually being killed 
but they do actually have a, a way of hiding from humans. And there were a lot of animals hiding in really, really thick areas around the park. Sorry, a lot of elephants hiding in thick areas amongst the parks. But the bulls are quite different. So, so elephant bulls will wander a lot further uh, and they'll move into areas where they could be harmed. So that then takes the genetics away. So bulls were taken from South Africa. Uh, so, uh, I mean, you're moving an elephant a long way by road. It's a, it's a huge, mm. huge hub where you've got cranes, you've got vets, you've got a huge amount of moving parts. And, and to be honest, moving an elephant that far by road is dangerous. I mean, there's a, there's a high mortality rate with moving animals, which, which a lot of people don't understand. If you want to restock an area with animals, there's a very good chance some of them will die on the way there. Uh, luckily, they didn't. And uh, the bulls came in, uh, the elephant bulls came in from South Africa. A hippopotamus came in as well. Uh, hippos are vital to that ecosystem because the movement of hippos keep an area open. Okay, So if you take hippos out of an area, all the water holes start to close up. Uh, water pathways that they keep open just by their movement starts to close up. Fish species disappear that rely directly on their, their dung. Um, th there's a huge knock-on effect if you take hippos out of a, a wetland area. So those are brought back. Those were seen to be something that was really needed to be brought back. So elephants, hippos came first. Uh, then cheetahs. Uh, cheetahs were, were brought in from South Africa as well. Unfortunately, that didn't go as well. Uh, I mean, cheetahs were brought in. I mean, cheetahs are a very, yeah, a very, I'd put it this a very soft animal to move. They, Finicky, yeah. They're, yeah, they really, really are not, not designed to take Africa's rigors, you know. Um, one of them was killed by a water buck. Uh, they were found on Game Drive after the release. The cheetah went out. We all thought, great, it killed a, um, a, a reed buck. Uh, we arrived on the, on the scene, and unfortunately, both the animals were dead. The water buck was dead, and the cheetah was dead because it got a horn in the stomach. But uh, And the others took off, and it, it just didn't work. Okay. So it just shows you how hard it is to move animals into an area and, and the learning curve that you need to move animals into a completely new area. Um, most of the animals came from South Africa. And then a lot of the larger plains games, um, like elant, which is a, a, a species that is uh, elant and zebra, uh, a species that are elant not so much, but zebra unique to that area. So there's a certain zebra called the crochet zebra, which is only very slightly different to the normal zebra. Um, that is only found in that area of Mozambique, that specific one. So I'm not quite sure if they figured out if it was a subspecies or, or not, but it was very important that we got zebra from the same area. So that's where we, we took them from Mozambique, which are hunting, far, hunting uh, reserves in Mozambique. So they had an excess of zebra, we had an excess of water buck. So we did a swap um, to get back what we needed to have a healthy ecosystem. Um, so yeah, so, so the animals came from a bunch of different places. Uh, that was all while I was there. But recently, they've got wild dogs in. So recently, I'd say the last year, they brought wild dogs into the ecosystem, which has proven to be amazing. They've uh, brought leopard into into Gorongosa, which is fantastic. It was one thing we always tried to find. Um, so yeah, you see, so yeah, basically, South Africa is where most of the animals came from, and then some of the plains came from Mozambique. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, are lions? Um, is that yeah. like on the radar, or is it like, or is it like a yeah. level at which wildlife is being reintroduced, or or has the lion population? Because you said that wasn't wiped out. Yeah. Um, no. Are they reestablishing themselves, or is there going to be a need mm. to bring in more? Well, I'm glad you asked about lions specifically. Uh, so we spent a lot of time with, with lions in Gorongosa. And no, no lions have been brought into Gorongosa. But the number has risen dramatically. So the reason it's risen dramatically is, is if you think about lions, they so a lion only needs three months. So a gestation of a lion period is three months. It's really quick. So For if an you animal that large. Them, <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, if you protect them, it's... Uh, they breed fairly, fairly quickly. So the lion population was, when we first got there, or when I first got there, and uh, the, the Gorongosa or the lion research team, a uh, brilliant lady called Paula Bulli, she, uh, she was like, what is going on, man? Every time we, uh, we think we have some cubs and we think we're getting a good number of lions, they just they disappear and they disappear. And then we found more and more lions and snares. So, so it was basically all down to snaring 
the, the lion population was down to snaring. So we had to do something about it. So we started putting collars on the lions to figure out where they went. And we would actively, this is how bad it was with snares, we'd actively send de-snaring teams out in front of the lions. So if the lions were in an area, we would send a team to that area and kind of walk the area that we thought they might head into. I mean, it was it was not a not an exact science, but we would walk the areas and try sweep the areas of uh, of snares. Um, this is before the poaching was was under control. So now it is under control, but at that stage it was just oh, the lions were getting decimated by snares. Not 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 set for lions. The snares were set for 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 meat animals. Um, but yeah, they were getting completely decimated. And now, now that that it is protected, and now there's very little snaring in Gorongo, so there's still a bit that goes on, but very little compared to what they used to be. The lion numbers are stabilizing and actually growing really, really well. And and lions do realize, and animals do realize where safe areas are. So a lot of the surrounding areas, the hunting katadas is what they're called in Mozambique, um, they have a lot of lions. And if you're a lion and you are not happy in an area and you're getting shot and there's snares everywhere and you can't make it in a certain area and you see an area next door that seems a bit better, you're going to move into that area, especially if you move into an area that's got more prey. So that dictates where an animal, especially a predator, goes. If there's more prey in there, I'll go there. So yeah, lions are doing really well in Gorongosa, really, really well. Oh, gosh, mm. that's... Mm. That's wonderful to hear. <laughs> That's awesome. It is. It's good news, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. Thank no. you for that. Because like you said, mm. it's just so often, mm. well, one, in this field, it's always the constant battle of, and this is why I think most of us are borderline alcoholics. It's like this constant yeah. battle of- Oh, you too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we talk about it all the time on this show. I'm like, let's be real. Almost every single night we need a glass of wine because of mm. just, just the emotional turmoil that we yeah. all have to go through because we care about this so much. And then all you hear yeah. is all this negative stuff. And oh my God, mm. like my favorite animal. I just heard that the, they're now put on a different part of the endangered list. You know what I mean? Just examples yeah. like that, that. That's just like a normal thing that we go through. So to hear yeah. something... Well, because if anybody knows anything about Mozambique, yeah, you don't know, mm. you don't hear about it for its stability. So no, like to no, hear yeah. something so amazing that's happened mm. on a gorgeous mm. area, it sounds absolutely amazing. I mean, like I've been to the Delta, been all over yeah. Okavango. So it sounds like this might be easily yeah, in comparison with that. There's, there's a lot of similarities between the Delta and Gorongosa, mm. actually. A lot, mm. yeah. Oh, I, can, I can totally see that. Absolutely. Mm. And so and so let's get back to you. Um, yeah. So in all of this, mm. what is like, I mean, what is your continuing role now? Or like, what do you view yourself as a part of this? Or is or have you moved on? Or like, are you mm. like, my work here is done. You are all exactly where you need to be. So, so where is yeah. Jeff in all of this now in 2021? So, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I spent about four and a half years in Gorongosa uh, with various parts of the project, doing filming, anti-poaching, and a bunch of, a bunch of other things. Uh, but, but you do realize after a certain time that, that it is your time to, to kind of move on. So, so other people came in and a lot of, a lot of different conservationists came into Gorongosa with amazing ideas and amazing projects. And it's like, okay. And, and you kind of step aside for them to do what they need to do. Um, and yeah, I wanted to see more as well. Uh, so, so Gorongosa is a very special place in my heart. It'll always be there, and I, I, I visit, I, I visit quite, uh, quite regularly. Um, but yeah, then, then I moved to Tanzania. So, um, I moved to a place in Tanzania. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of the Salu Game Reserve in Tanzania. Mm, I don't it, know. It's, Maybe. It's, <laughs> It's not very common. Yeah, okay, it's, it's, it's like it's I not saw a, so much of it. I, I should just send you my itinerary when I was there. I was like, I went to all of these places. <laughs> just <laughs> let me know where things are in relation to it. But yes, keep going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's it's not a common place for people to go. It's uh, it's huge. So oh, yeah. it's it's one of the biggest protected areas in Tanzania. It's a uh, fifty-five thousand square kilometers. Sorry, I think that's thirty something thousand square miles. That's huge. Um, it's big. It's really really big, and um, it is the southern part of it is is hunting concessions, and the northern part of it. The southern part is consumptive, and northern part is uh, unconsumptive. So it's basically used for photographic tourism wise. But Salu had one of the biggest issues of, of poaching ever in Africa. So, so the elephant population in Salu was somewhere near 100,000 elephants. I think it was 90 something thousand elephants. And within about seven years, that came down to 13,000 elephants. So yeah, 
Jesus. It was probably one, one of the, the, the biggest declines in elephant numbers anywhere in Africa that's ever happened. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that caught my interest. That, uh, that made me go, hey, there's, there's something going on there. And I want to go there. And I want to see if I can help. I want to see if I can get involved in some way or the other. The, the kind of conservation bug had bit at that time. And uh, I was happy with what I'd done in Mozambique. And I was happy with the experience that I had gained. Because I learned a, a huge amount in Mozambique about how to deal with these things. And another step is going into an area where it's even worse. Went way worse, way, way worse. So getting into Tanzania is not that easy. Uh, so finding a, a, say, a conservation job in Tanzania or a way to get in and help is is really, really tough. Mm, so if you've that. got a lot of, yeah, it's, if you've got a lot of degrees behind you, if you've got a lot of experience behind you, you say, I want to go save elephants in Tanzania. Uh, it's really hard. <laughs> it's it's really, really hard. Um, so, so I went to an area in Saloon um that was run by a safari camp uh and i went in there to train guides run the camp and uh, see what i could do from there and that was my inn to tanzania it was beautiful it's on the rafiji river which is one of the biggest rivers in tanzania which cuts the park in two between consumptive and unconsumptive hunting or, or consumptive tourism and unconsumptive and um yeah i spent the next two years in that park figuring it out uh making management plans for the area that we worked in training the guides in that area training the rangers in that area um so th this was quite a big inn to, to what was actually going on in the park at the time was taking the, the government rangers who were there to protect the park, totally under underfunded, underutilized, but um, taking them in and actually taking them on firearms training, which I did with all of them and the company that I was working for paid for them to do that. And they then would join me on all of my training walks for the rangers in the area. Sorry, for the, 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 the tourist guides in the area. So in that way, we started to figure out that, okay, there's a few really good individuals that could do a lot more in protecting that area. Um, so yeah, that got more and, I got more and more involved in training the rangers in that area, the government rangers in that area. Mm. Um, so that evolved from one thing to the next. Um, and yeah, it was really good. The, the, the poaching or the government put a big initiative forward to, to stop poaching in that area. Um, they did a lot of work. But also, there were not very many elephants left to poach, so there was an exponential growth in in, in not poaching uh, all of a sudden. Because when you get to a small amount of animals, not a lot are being shot. So it seemed like a victory um, for that area, but it's still recovering right now. It's really a t it's going to be a long, long time before you they get anywhere near the the numbers they used to have. Um, so yeah, I spent a few years there. And then move to something you know a lot about. Um, yeah, well, I am, um, to be 100% honest with you, working in conservation and working uh, in the ways that I was, it doesn't really pay very much, to be honest. So no, it does not. <laughs> it, really, it, really, it really doesn't. So, yeah, so I uh, met someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew about NetHab. Uh, and they said, Jeff, we'd love you to come and talk to people at NetHab and guide for us to so take people around the world on, on safaris and, uh, yeah, do that. So, so I said, okay, that sounds good. So I chatted to someone who chatted to someone and found myself in the States, uh, at the guide training, um, in, uh, in Boulder. And, um, yeah, that was that for another couple of years. So I guided for NetHab, uh, mostly in East Africa, including Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Kenya, and Madagascar, which is great. Don't get me wrong, it was really, really great. Uh, good company, and it was a great place, but I felt like I kind of sold out in a big way, you know, um, where I was taking exceptionally wealthy people out on safaris, and yes, there is a conservation aspect to that, especially with NetHub. They, they're a conservation oriented company. Uh, but it didn't feel like I was doing it, you know what I mean? Didn't feel like I was actually directly contributing and using skills that I had gained to actually further, further conservation in any way. I can relate to that feeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so it ended, and it was a good couple of years with NetHub. Lovely company, nothing against them. But uh, I wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
that's where we are now. I decided I wanted to start my own guiding company focused on conservation safaris. So safaris, yeah. Safaris that would encompass like real, like direct benefits from you coming on safari to where you went on safari. So I, the, the plans were to set up, um, so if you want to get involved, like hands-on experience, and I have friends all around Africa who need money to dart an elephant or need money to collar a lion or need money to do these things. And I'm not sure about you, but I know most people that I take on safari, uh, especially like a little bit younger, would lose their shit if they got to get involved in collaring a lion. Or actually, I'm losing my shit, and I'm yeah. currently in southern Ohio just thinking about <laughs> it. Yes. Yeah. If if you were involved, like directly involved in 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 an elephant capture or a giraffe capture, whatever it may be, and you you're you were gonna pay, I don't know, ten dollars for that safari. I'm just that that is not the cost. But if you were gonna pay ten thousand dollars for that safari, or you're gonna pay if you got to do that, you'd probably pay a bit more. Uh, and the majority of all that cash goes back to that project. So it doesn't go to a tour company. It doesn't go to, to anyone else apart from that project. So that collaring, like a collar is a ridiculous amount of money. Getting a helicopter in the air is a ridiculous amount of money. And that was the idea to incorporate that into the safaris. So, and we, and we had quite a few bookings and a lot of people were getting involved. And then unfortunately COVID decided to change all of our plans. Um, so yeah. It's 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 been put on hold, but it's still there. And yeah, in our downtime, we've been marketing, we've been building camps, which is how we kind of we kind of connected. Uh, some photos of a camp that we've put up. Um, it looks amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. It is. It, it it's it's small. So we decided we want to have, have a camp for people that actually want to adventure. Okay, you still have all your luxuries and you have everything that you would possibly need, but the, the design of the camp is for adventure-oriented people. So people who are not happy to go and sit on a game drive vehicle and bounce around for hours and hours on end and just, just be a spectator on a safari. If you come in on safari, you want to be a participant. And I've spent many, many years taking spectators on safari. And to be honest, they not as involved and I'm not as involved. Um, it's a little bit boring. I know it sounds, sounds bad for me to say that, but it is a bit boring taking people and looking at animals doing nothing and just sitting on a car. Um, you don't get an idea of what it's about. You don't get to feel the landscape. You don't get to, to actually walk through a river and feel what the water feels. It's, it's a totally different experience. So we designed this camp with that in mind where it's totally open all around you. Uh, it's a octagonal tent with, yeah, what you can basically see out of every side of the tent, which makes it super fun when animals come through the, oh the camp God, at night. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun. Um, yeah, and, and, and the activities that are designed with it, we try to, to make everything as conservation orientated as we can. So Tanzania has got 30% of Tanzania is set aside for, for wilderness areas. Okay. Out of that 30%, 15% is national park or 14 point something is national parks. Um, the other 15% is not national park. It's wilderness areas, game management, management areas. Um, so more than half of the wildlife in Tanzania is all outside of national parks. And 95% of all the people that come into Tanzania go into national parks. So, so you've got this huge amount of landmass in this huge area full of animals that are just really unpopular because of the Serengeti, because of these really cool parks, which they are amazing parks. You've seen them. They're amazing parks. In They're beautiful. Yeah. And all of, these, all of these areas around the national parks, these wilderness management areas or these game control areas are, are vital to buffer those national parks. And the experiences we can have there are a lot more immersive than what we could do in the parks. So in the parks, driving at night is really, you, you, you have to pay quite a lot of money to drive at night in national parks. And you're only allowed to drive for a very short period of time. With walking, you're only allowed to walk in very certain areas and you're only allowed to walk um, with a ranger with the, in this specific area. So 
So it kind of made sense for us to go, well, let's, let's work outside national parks. If you want to go in, we can still go in, but let's work outside national parks. We can walk the entire day anywhere we want. We can track, we can find tracks of the lion and track that line for the entire day until we find it. There's no time limit. There's only our limits as to how far we can walk. <laughs> um, let's go on night drives. If we're sitting in the camp in the middle of the night at 12 o'clock at night, everyone's fast asleep, snoring away, and we hear lions and hyenas having a massive bust up, I will run to each one of the tents, wake everyone up in the tents and say, let's go and find that. Which is which is phenomenal. You can't do that in a national park. No. So we will jump on a vehicle, which we did. This lot, those photos were the first time we set the camp up, by the way. Oh, really? And that's you exactly. Said yeah. Oh that was my the first gosh. time we actually set it up. Mm. And on that that exact night, we took the photos. That's what happened. We were sitting around at camp. We weren't sleeping, but we suddenly heard this like massive commotion of lions and hyenas fighting each other. And we're like, what the hell? And we're like, we actually had to just take a step back and go, oh man, it'd be nice if we could get there. And we're like, we, we can. We can. We're not in the national park. <laughs> <laughs> we can actually go there. So everyone jumped on board and we zooted across the plains. And amazing, amazing time with, with lions interacting with hyenas. There was a whole bust up going on between the two. Uh, just killed the wildebeest. It was like, like an amazing, amazing sighting with not a soul around. No, no one's around. Th that's something that that's also just blows my mind is we can we can go out to these places and find really, really cool stuff and not share it with anyone. Mm. It's like a totally private story. <laughs> it's great. You sound like Botswana. Really, really it sounds like you've like taken Botswana and just plopped it into Tanzania. Like that's why I love Botswana so much yeah. um, in comparison mm. to Tanzania. But again, just like yeah. you said, I was mm. I was there for conservation work, so it was a it was a little mm. different. Um, yeah. But I was in all of the national parks, and mm. and I did go through the Serengeti, and luckily I was there in mm. a time when it wasn't that um, touristy. But still, like yeah. that. Mm. Oh, <laughs> I yeah. could have been in your it's, safari it's a big with that. Like, oh my yeah. god! <laughs> I'm like, having, really, if you can see really me like moving around one. in my seat right now, I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> 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 yeah so so hopefully hopefully like like people will start to see this and, and but by making it popular if it makes you this excited okay if it makes you this excited that you can come to a place and you can actually experience this without and what one it's a lot cheaper too you don't have national park fees that you're paying for um so that's that's an added bonus but i mean it's not so much about the cost but all of those fees that you are paying are then going into a wilderness management area which then can make that area better, a lot better, and can bolster that area. And eventually, the national parks will creep out into those areas. So it's an intensive protection zone that you're trying to increase by taking people on a good time, basically. Um, we did notice a few things, and I've noticed, so I, I've, I've done this for the last 20 years or so. So, so that, that brief, brief thing that I told you, or story I told you about when I started to now is, is a 20 year period. Okay, so, and what I've noticed is that like, we, re we really impact the animals that we're out with. So on that, on that, on that, uh, that sighting, we all jumped into a vehicle and we drove out really quickly and we, we saw the animals. The lioness was fine with us, but the hyenas shied away from the light. Every time we put a light near them, they were like, gone. Okay, they haven't seen many cars in that area. Um, and we were, we, were, we were talking about like, well, why don't we, why don't we, turn all the lights off and do it in, in, in night vision. So we decided to get that sorted. So we've got really cool night vision equipment now that we will put a screen in the front of the vehicle. And then we have a mounted camera on the vehicle that we can tilt and turn and put it in different ways. Actually two different types. One is a thermal camera, which sees heat signatures at a long way off. And then one is a, also an infrared camera, but not quite as thermal, which you can actually see color. So we can see exactly what's going on without ever having to turn a light on, which is pretty amazing. We can drive through the night without any lights on and, and be able to see absolutely everything that's there. So you get a truly like unique view of what happens when animals are, are roaming around at night without your influence, which is... <laughs> is I'm speechless it's currently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean... Apart from the fact that it's just a lot of fun, you know, like actually a lot of fun just going out and seeing that, but also it lessens the impact on the animals. And um, yeah, it's just, 
just cool, man. <laughs> yeah. And is this just one vehicle, two vehicles? So what is the size of this camp? Like, like let's say that. But so we, how many people would be involved? Good question. Good question. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's small. Okay. So there's only four tents. So there's four tents, so you can put two people in each tent. Um, I mean, we could make it bigger, but we want to kind of keep it a bit smaller um, because it's it's just a little bit more intimate. Um, we we can control what happens. We have two vehicles, so we can go out in different directions. Um, even even like even the vehicles that we have, they're really cool. One is a closed vehicle with open top, and the other one is a completely open vehicle. Mm -hmm. So we can do like long distance full of dust, where you don't really want to be driving a, a closed vehicle and just eat dust for the entire day. <laughs> um, or you can go in a completely open vehicle at night with really cool, funky cameras. Um, but even the vehicles we use are are completely upcycled vehicles. So nothing is new. We've literally built the vehicles from from bottom up. So we've gone to scrapyard and we've we've basically found all these parts, put them together, and made what looks like a very very cool vehicle on the outside. But it's actually old disused parts that we've put together and made a really cool vehicle or two vehicles actually, three vehicles actually. One is to carry all the equipment. Yeah. yeah. So we have one vehicle, which is basically a Land Rover. One Land Rover that I don't know if you've ever seen a an ambulance Land Rover. Maybe Basically, once in Tanzania, but that was it. But not, but not like in the bush. But not like, yeah, no, not in the bush. No, no, no. So, so we we we've found one of those cars, and we've we've gutted it out inside, and we've we've managed to make that our transport, because where we go is really tough. So some of the areas we we try to get to, it's really muddy, and there's, it's a it's a terrible road to get there. And most of the other trucks or whatever would take a safari camp just can't get there. Mm. So it's kind of cool. It 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 makes us able to get to areas other people can't um so yeah everything fits into one uh ambulance land rover that we've taken the lights off just so it doesn't look like an ambulance <laughs> but uh, everything fits into one ambulance land rover and then we have two other vehicles that we use um and all the vehicles run on ethanol which is kind of cool when people hear ethanol they get a bit funny but there's a sugar a sugar plantation not too far from from Arusha, and the byproduct of what they have is a, a molasses type thing, which they turn into ethanol. So it's a pre-existing uh, uh, business that has a byproduct of ethanol, and we use that because it is way, way better to use ethanol than to use petrol, if you think about it in a bigger term. Uh, it's more expensive, uh, it has a few more issues, but we want to use it. Yeah. <laughs> Can I book so a flight now? <laughs> yeah, please, please do. Yeah, please do. It's actually the best time to come right now. Oh, um, yeah, we, we we haven't actually, to be 100% honest with you, we haven't taken a safari. So with this new camp, we've done friends and a bunch of us went out together. Uh, friends of ours, ours who fly microlites, they came in and landed in front of the camp in a microlite, and we did a little jolly around the area. But we haven't actually taken paying guests, obviously, because of time. There's, there's not many people traveling at the moment. But uh, yeah, which is cool, because it gives us time to, to get it right, you know? Yeah, to actually uh, try it out right before. Yeah. yeah. And how exactly you want to yeah. market it and all those kinds of things. Yeah. Like, actually, now that we're doing this, this very particular subset of travelers is who we want to, you yeah. know, really make sure totally. we get on it. Yeah, because <laughs> I mean, I've done some trips before and knowing mm. the <clears throat> higher end luxury mm. safari guests that I have yeah. been around, mm -hmm. there is no way that they <laughs> want to do that style trip. But someone like me no or some of the, no. like, you know, some other people that I know or just more adventurous people that even if they are yeah. like in the wealthier demographic, but they want the adventure. Yeah. This is right up their alley. Totally. Totally, yeah. <clears throat> and you're 100% right. Like, finding the right people for the safari, like, we actually don't want, like, we don't want to take people on a safari who don't appreciate what it is, you know? We don't want to pay, take people on a safari who don't appreciate the, the conservation side of it. Um, and I mean, inevitably, they will be. But ideally, we want people who, who actually give a shit. Yeah. Know? I was actually going to ask we about that. Um, mm. How, how are, so, so you were telling mm. me about this amazing you know, safari conservation idea that you had um, that unfortunately stopped you because of COVID of like, mm -hmm. all these great trips of like, you're paying all this work goes to these projects that we're partnered with. How are you going mm -hmm. to work that in with this new like adventure style? Like, are, are you going to partner them in a similar way? Or how are you yeah. bringing conservation into these as well? So, so these, 
when we do those trips, so, so say we need an elephant dotted in one of these areas, Tanzania is a little bit harder to get it done, but we're working on getting it done here. Uh, say if we did need a, an elephant dotted in one of these areas, like the, the wilderness management areas, then we use that camp. So we would then set up a camp in that area and use it in the area that needs the, the elephant dotted, if, if it's viable. I mean, there's a lot of working parts and those kind of things. Uh, you can't just ask, ask the elephant to wait kind of thing. <laughs> so, but like, no, you might just hang it on a bit. But I mean, coloring and like blood samples and things like that, you can, you can generally schedule them uh, to when you want it to happen. And then, then you have people on standby for really cool experiences. You're like, if, if I call you sometime in this year and give you two weeks notice that we are going to have to get this done, will you come on board? And a lot of people have said, yes, they would. They would drop a lot and get a ticket and come over and, and do this. So then we use the camp for that. So the camp's not going to be busy all the time. We can't fit it all the time. So the ideal solution is the, the safaris that I do are, are all throughout Africa. So this could be come to Mozambique and dart an elephant, come to Zambia and dart an elephant, come to Namibia and, and I don't know, dart a lion or something. So it's all around Africa that I want to do it. Mm. Uh, basically have a connection of all the conservation groups, or all of them that are willing to, to basically have their projects funded for them with a tag on like me and a few guests. So, so smart. Yeah. genius genius if, i mean i mean it's 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 not easy no to logistically make that work uh, that's why not many people do it mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah but but i think the background i have is suited to it and uh i mean africa is about context especially like the conservation game in africa is a lot to do with context so um yeah hopefully i'm in the right spot to do it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you are. I mean, the fact yeah. that you've even gotten this far, honestly, because mm -hmm. I feel like if an idea like that wasn't meant to work at this time, you wouldn't mm -hmm. even have gotten this far. So the fact that you already have the yeah. camp, you have this unbelievable night safari truck that I need to mm -hmm. see. This sounds unbelievable. <laughs> like, is it even like so many like night on planet Earth or like night on Earth or whatever? So mm -hmm. many like Netflix documentaries have recently come out and I'm just seeing yeah. this vehicle like like one of those documentaries which is so cool <laughs> it's so cool um yeah that really really would be a oh yeah. my god and it's, it's it's gonna work definitely gonna work <laughs> would you excuse me for one minute I need to top this whiskey up um <laughs> yes go get your whiskey like not even a question <laughs> All right, that's so much better. Oh, uh, what's your whiskey? So whiskey's my favorite, by the way. I'm a bourbon girl. Really? Um, oh. That's not whiskey, you know. Well, I know, but <laughs> it's in it's, it's in the uh, greater umbrella. So definitely grew up drinking whiskey, just straight freaking Jack Daniels to the face because mm. that's what I used to do, and okay. you know, and then moved to bourbon. I matured and started yeah. drinking mm -hmm. bourbon. So, um, yeah, no longer taking Jack to the face. Um, <laughs> being sometimes to the face. Yeah. So what I'm whiskey are you drinking? Unfortunately, with my Scottish heritage, it has to stay Scottish. You see? Oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. So this is, a, this is a this is a Lafroy, which is a good whiskey. Yeah, it's a good okay. whiskey. Yeah, you, nice you, peaty, smoky whiskey. Mm. Some people say it tastes like mouthwash, but I, I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that when we come, we go on safari. We're gonna have to do a whole like whiskey tour at the exact same time. Oh. I'll try to bring some stuff with me. Well, oh, man, mm. I have a strict carry-on only travel policy so i don't know what i'll be able uh, okay. to bring over <laughs> yeah okay okay we'll figure, we'll figure that out. Oh. yeah we'll figure that, out. that sounds awesome you can make you it you can make beer i was looking at our messages you have craft yes. beer on this freaking safari yes. like what yes. the hell <laughs> so so i forgot to i forgot to mention that in the safari so uh my partner in the safaris he uh, he actually builds the tents himself. So mm -hmm. he does the tents. He has a lodge here in Arusha called Ngara Sera Mountain Lodge, mm -hmm. which is a very cool old farmhouse, which his family have owned for a very, very long Definitely time. Definitely saw that in like all the custom stuff that that yeah. used to do. So it was like, I actually yeah. was like, 
I wait, I know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I introduced NatHab to Ngarasero and oh, they started right. using that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still waiting for the commission, but um, yeah, yeah, I was like, oh, um, well, you're, you're not getting that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so 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 Tim Tim has uh, has grown up his whole life in Tanzania. Uh, he is a very interesting individual. He is the driving force behind all the weird technological things in the camp. Mm. Um, and he um, he does craft beer. So he, it's actually his birthday tonight, uh, which oh. after this, I'm going straight to get more craft beer. Um, <laughs> yeah, he has a brewery at an old fish farm. So there used to be a trout farm on Ngara Cerro, um, which is now turned into a brewery. Uh, it's very small. It's very small. It, it, it's basically a bunch of uh, a bunch of bunch of us who get together once a week, and we go down and we mix up the mash and we set the burners and we do two three hundred liters of beer, um, and it's really good. So that is going to be a feature of every single safari. Oh One, not because the guests need it, but we need it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, the guests aren't the only ones out in the bush at the exact same time. You are too, exactly. so. <laughs> our, our, our health and well-being needs to come first if you're uh, going to come first. You know? Yeah. <laughs> So, so yeah, so that that's really cool. We've got like this wooden uh, bar that we're building at the moment. We've got one, but we want to make it bigger and better and nice. Um, and three different types of beer. So there's a dark pale and a pale ale, and then a honey mead, which we're doing as well. Stop it! Mm. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, so all of those things on safari. And then for kids, we've got a honey soda. So another tap. Oh. Uh, it's a stingless bee honey soda, which is very very fancy. Yeah, hmm. that sounds amazing. Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's quite a shocking thing. I don't think there's any other safari camp that has has beer on tap in the middle of the bush. Oh my mm -hmm. god! Yeah, I'm definitely gonna share all the pictures because I'm sure when when this goes out, people are gonna be like, "What are you talking about?" It's like I got pictures. <laughs> I will share what this looks like because it's just I just I remember that. I'm like, wait a second, did did you see there was craft beer oh, <laughs> on tap? Jesus! <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'll send you. I'll send you some more pictures. Uh, oh, please. Yeah. Then I then I can share all of them. So I did have yeah. a question. Um, and this so this is just like a personal project I did for my masters. Mm -hmm. And Bill, who I was telling you about, um, who was on my podcast, who has uh, the Wild Source. Um, I did it with him. So I did this project where um, I took citizen science into the safari industry. So with <laughs> his with his guest we did this project and we studied the increase in empathy um, for these mm. safari participants that did citizen science mm. while on safari so like you okay. said because it can get pretty yeah. boring it can mm -hmm. get pretty boring when you're just hanging mm. out you're just watching the same thing over and over especially if they're not really into the wildlife like someone like me totally. i'm freaking out the entire freaking time yeah. but i'm one i'm one traveler that you might have in a year like i yeah. i've realized this um, totally. when I've gone to Africa. And so what we did is we had this project where I built a very rudimentary app and, mm -hmm. um, the guides would then record what they're seeing. And, and for mm -hmm. this particular study, it was just big cats. Cause you know, it's a study. Um, yeah. and my results were absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. So now mm -hmm. there, where these camps are, there's a long-term study because then Bill loved mm -hmm. the project so much that he invested in his own app that all of his wow. guides have access to, um, where okay. all of their wildlife sightings, they put in this app and then it's uploaded to a database. And then mm -hmm. all of their safari participants that are interested are then brought mm -hmm. in as citizen scientists. So as they're doing all the logs, I mean, especially with the kids, they're like really into mm -hmm. it. And that, I guess that's been going on now for like three or four years or something. So really? now already, yeah, so already there's like, four years of data because before the guys were just you know just writing on a piece of paper and bill's like can i have this data in some way they're like we're bill we're in the bush mm -hmm. like I, maybe you'll get this data but so mm -hmm. it's all in this app just like on a little ipad charge yeah. it up and then they put it in there and so i mean i don't That's know if fantastic. you thought about something like that but that might be another mm -hmm. way like another element i was mm -hmm. trying to do this really hard at nathab i didn't get very yeah. far but i got some projects done which was really cool uh, like on polar yeah. bears and stuff i was able to get a citizen science project started there um but it's just seeing how i mean i studied it like seeing the results was amazing yeah. Yeah. um and like i said so this day they 
they're still doing it at these camps. So, um, I mean, like that's another way maybe too. I just wanted to like plant a seed uh, of that. Um, That's a really interesting way. Yeah, super, super interesting. Yeah. yeah, so something a lot similar to those lines that, that we did in, in Gorongosa is we, we had over, I think, 200 um, trail cameras up at any one mm. time. Mm-hmm. So, like, literally hundreds upon thousands of images that these trail cameras would stay out for a month, month or two. And then you'd have thousands of Im- images that you needed to, to categorize and put into certain places. And there are a thousand people at home that would love to just sit and look through photos and go, Okay, that's a lion, that's a bird, that's a this, that's a that. So citizen science is like, I think it's good. I think it's mm-hmm. really good. If done right, it can be really good. And that that data that you were telling about, if 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 I got you correctly, it's it's guides that are coming back and saying, I saw this, that, 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 that. No, that, so the that, iPads that. are with them. Like oh, in the in them? the okay. like in the safari vehicle. So it's like right, so okay. it's elevating the the viewing experience so they're, so they're going from simply observers to scientists they're like okay so right now we are uh-huh. currently observing this cheetah i'm here all the time i know who this cheetah is let's see right. what it does and then following it and like if it hunts something what did it hunt so it took out an email yeah. this time was it successful oh. was it not um so it's mm. more so it's so it's taking the very scientific side of like, okay, mm-hmm. this is what the wildlife is doing. The guides know mm-hmm. it so well. Um, yeah. So they're like, I even know these cats, which is always, that's not necessary. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the safari participants who are normally mm-hmm. just looking yeah. Yeah, like, well, that exactly. was cool. That's a cheetah. It's like, actually, mm-hmm. let's look at it from a scientific side. What is the mm-hmm. cheetah doing? How old is this yeah. cheetah? Do we know mm-hmm. this cheetah? Is it hunting? Is it sleeping? Like, what is it doing? So, um, yeah. and all the that's all amazing my, to capture yeah yeah and so yeah. it's turned into a long-term wildlife study and mm. it's also engaging all the participants that go mm-hmm. in into a different way yeah. so they're not just looking at a cheetah um you know they they have a scientific brain because you know the guy's wow. like hey this is what we're mm. looking at we let, let's actually write yeah. the, write in our observation so um mm. yeah i'm thinking that is, that is marketing material as well as brilliant <laughs> so if, if if you are talking to a guest who's coming out on safari and you say to them before they come on safari, do you mind helping in a research project where you're trying to figure out how many lions are in or what the behavior of these lions mm-hmm. in the area is, could you, while you're there, look at a tablet and go through a few things for us? I think every single person would say yes. Yes, exactly. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. And then also, too, because, you know, there's so many papers out there that are kind of like iffy about citizen scientists because they're not yeah. trained scientists. The biggest yeah. thing about this study that I did, which was really cool, is those fears, I guess you can say, mm. or, or disqualifications of the research go away mm. because the trained person who mm. is the guide is there yeah. at all times and yeah. monitoring these observations that are then put into the database. So yeah, you know 100% yeah. that all of these observations are real are and legit. correct yeah. because the guide is there and they obviously know the wildlife like the back of their hand. Yeah. So, so no, yeah. that's great. See? Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't even think about bringing this up, but I just like, mm, you know, how do I get to that? Um, we can chat about it. <laughs> <laughs> we can set something up offline maybe about making that. Cause it seems like that, cause I wouldn't normally bring that up in most situations, yeah. but it seems that that is so in line with it's your funny. heart with your heart and i mean even i can even connect it with bill because totally. bill's like he's like that one kind of my biggest thing, mentors yeah yeah mm-hmm. well, well that kind of thing would make so much sense in an area that's already threatened you know yes so, so the areas that we work in or we, we're hoping to work in with this camp is areas that are kind of on the fringes of national parks there's still lions and there's still a lot of animals in the national park or sorry in the areas outside of the national parks but there's also a lot of other there's also a lot of uh, livestock so mm-hmm. it's not uncommon to see a cow walking past a herd of elephants or sitting watching lions eating and seeing a few messiahs walking in the distance, you know? So and those areas are really under a lot of a lot of a lot of struggle at the moment. There's a huge human wildlife conflict that's going on all over Tanzania, all over Africa, outside of national parks. So the value like getting data on a lioness that we see in an area like that is way more important than in a national park. So if we can figure out what that lioness is doing and we can have, I don't know, a couple of years of data of seeing that lioness just by guests going out and 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 
recording her movements, what she was like, her condition. That's great. It's really great. We can get a picture of what's going on in the area. Yeah, because because if you're seeing things that most people can't simply because you have the technology to do like these night safaris, like just imagine if you were able to record all of these observations. And like I said, then it becomes a whole database, especially if you're in these areas that aren't normally touched by tourists. And since there's a reason to be there, you know, because, you know, for research projects, you have to have grants, you have to do all this stuff, okay. but like, but the money's already there. Like there's already yeah. a reason to be in that. This is why I love tourism so much and why I'm currently yeah. just like babbling at you. Um, right. Like you have a reason to be there and to study the wildlife and then just imagine how much those guests are going to care afterwards. Exactly. I mean, your safari already sounds amazing. Like (laughs) my wheels are turning. Adding (laughs) adding those things together, making someone feel, feel like maybe liable is the wrong word, but personally invested in what they see makes it important. Okay, I can take you and I can show you a group of lions, and then I can take you and ask you to record details about those lions, and you've you've automatically got a connection with the lions. Especially so if you see them again, can you imagine that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that could work really, really well. Yeah, mm. so there's out in out in areas that really need it in Tanzania. Not just doing it because, yeah, the research project's really great, and there's I see it all the time. There's a thousand and one people running around doing their PhDs doing no good whatsoever. But um, I see a huge advantage in doing it in areas outside of national parks. Mm. Let's work on this. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> mm. I didn't yeah. even expect this to come up. Because again, like in these conversations, I, I, I really just don't talk much, but I was like, hmm. this might be, hmm. I don't know. We might be able to get some really amazing going, but we'll, yeah. we'll work on that. We'll work on that. Let's, let's keep chatting about yeah. that. But that, that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. <sighs> yeah. So, awesome. so in a nutshell, that's, that's basically what it is. Mm. So, and so what is the name of your company? Like, let's say that anyone listening, <sighs> are you still working on a name? Yeah, <laughs> we, we don't we don't actually have a name for for it yet. Um, so how I do my safaris is just basically people I've guided over the last twenty years who know me and they know who I am and they want to come on safari with me. It's basically like I hope if they don't see this, I don't mean any offense, but safari groupies, you know. So so you you get to go on safari with someone and you 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 get along. So on both mm-hmm. sides. You get along and um, they stay with you for your career kind of thing. They Every couple of years or every year, they will call you and say, I want to go on a safari. So so I've never really needed the name, like needed a name for a safari or a name for a company, so to speak. But now we kind of do because we have a camp. So any they ideas, any suggestions on a name for a camp? <laughs> I mean, yeah? not off the top of my head, simply because I'm the worst no. at naming things. It took me months okay. to just name this podcast. So, um, but maybe, good I name, don't know. By the way. Maybe, Rewildology oh, is a very, very good name. Yeah. Thank you. I've got so many compliments on already, you know? I don't, I don't know. I, I Googled so hard. I looked at trademarks. Mm. I looked at Google. I looked at everything and I, and mm. it took me a while, but, but I finally came up with the name uh-huh. and I really love it. So because mm. because rewilding is such a good concept, you know, mm-hmm. rewild all. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And so I got, I got the idea while watching like David Attenborough's uh, most recent documentary where it was like his witness statement, like that really yeah. insanely, mm-hmm depressing incredible amazing documentary and he just kept talking about rewild because i didn't know what the hell to name this thing and so (laughs) and i just sat with it for a long time and then i was like okay Mm. rewildology i don't know maybe we can crowdsource people listening to see if they want to come up with ideas and yeah yeah, come up with a name for a safari camp yeah a conservation safari camp in africa but it it has to be a camp and initiative you know it's not just a camp it's a it's a That's conservation super adventure, adventure yeah. y style. Yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah, we're we'll still thinking. We're yeah. still thinking. Yeah. Yeah, so, if anybody has thinking. any ideas, I'll put a call out on social media or anyone listening, like, hey, do you have any ideas for this? Especially after Please, seeing, yeah. especially after seeing the no. photos of the camp too. So. And, and if we use the name, if we use the name, then we give them one free beer. <laughs> 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 like it's all I got it right now. It's just one free beer. <laughs> yeah, man. Times are tough. <laughs> 
Oh, great. Um, so, so for so next, and this um, this next question too is just one that I, I love to ask everybody in in our field because the more we talk about it, just the easier it'll be for everybody. But what has been your biggest struggle that you've gone through in your career or currently going through, and how have you yeah. managed it? Yeah, currently is a good one. <laughs> currently is a really good one actually so, so i mean the whole the whole safari industry has been really hit okay so and it's the safari industry it's a tourism industry in any country around the world it's been hit really really hard <laughs> uh, a lot of people are, are really not surviving because they, their bread and butter was foreigners coming into the country and spending money in the countries um so yeah i'd, I'd say the hardest time for safaris is now there's never been a harder time uh, there's never been a harder time for animals and there's never been a harder time for animals say in all the national parks they have no protection anymore so yes rangers and i'm going off a little bit off topic here but it, it, it it's worth it because rangers and wildlife people who are paid to protect wildlife only do a very small percentage of protection the rest of the protection in national parks comes from tourists, comes from the vehicles that are driving every single day, going up and down through a national park. You can't, as a poacher, walk in an area with lots of tourists because you're going to be spotted, you're going to be seen. Um, so the deterrent of, of humans in a national park is huge. And there's been a massive rise in poaching uh, in all the national parks around Africa because mm -hmm. there's no one in them at the moment. So there's not enough guides going out and the guides also don't see footprints and so, so 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 that is the biggest challenges not me but personally but but wildlife at the moment that's huge it's really really big it just shows how important tourism is to to keep a to keep national parks going like really really important um struggles struggles has been yeah maybe red tape <laughs> So in terms of any conservation initiative I've ever been involved in, it's, it's, it's always red tape between either government or NGOs. There's, there's, there's not a good, uh, good cooperation between people trying to help. So I was talking about this the other night, and so there's 20, 30 conservation organizations in Africa. Oh, sorry, in, in Tanzania, that are all working on trying to save the lesser spotted red shrew. Okay, that's not a real thing. But uh, they're all trying to save this red shrew, and, and none of them communicate with each other. So there's a massive amount of research that they do, and there's a massive amount of research that they do, but they don't talk to each other about the research. So it's a massive struggle in conservation, and it must be around the world as well, but I only have... I only have uh, uh, knowledge of Africa. Um, there's really a disconnect with people who actually want to do like meaningful work in Africa, and people who want to say they are doing meaningful meaningful work in Africa. So ideally, getting everyone together and getting everyone on the same page uh, that they can work off work that's already been done would be a game changer in conservation. Mm. Does that make sense? <clears throat> oh no, I can, I completely agree. This is such a big problem that I've you know just observed so many times over the years that I view my role now is to connect. I'm, and yeah. already I've connected so many people with each other. I'm like, you don't mm. know each other yet. I have no idea what you can do together, but you, yeah. you two need to know each other. And so many times people have just thanked me up and down because they're mm. like, no one does this. There's so much competition. I'm like, we're all doing the same thing. I don't exactly. care. I mean, I'm like making friends with a whole bunch of other, other nature podcasts. And I'm like, how can we help each other? Like the yeah. more we're all in this together. And I was like, if I have a great guest on that, their share, their story needs to be shared. They would also be a perfect guest for you. I don't care that they've already been in mind. That, that's yeah. not the reason of this. The reason is no. to share your amazing story to make people fall in love with you so that they can support you. And if I can help with that in any way, then I'll feel fulfilled. Like, and totally. that's what, that's the message that we need to keep getting mm -hmm. out in the world. And totally. so why are we totally. fighting each other? Why are we fighting each other? Like, this is ridiculous. Um, yeah, so the more we can say that, and it's like, 
please come work with Jeff. I don't care what you do. If you feel like you can work with Jeff, I will connect you to in yeah. any way, shape or form or vice versa. No, it should be like, it, yeah, the, the, the personal gains and the greater gains are two different things. You know? mm. Right. It's like when you take your ego out of this and you exactly. stay humble, just yeah. imagine the amount yeah. of work that can get done yeah. at the end of the day. And the amount of work you don't need to do. Yes, yeah, someone know? else has already done it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm all about doing things efficiently, you know? Exactly. I'm the exact same way. I completely exactly. agree. Yeah. So that, yeah, that is a struggle. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure any other struggle comes to mind. Mm. I mean, there's that's lots. Good. But there's... <laughs> Just like one that's so mm, big that you're yeah. dealing with right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's you, a big one. That you come across often, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So do you have any advice for anybody listening? Yeah, yeah. You you just said it earlier. Take take those egos out of the equation, you know. Um, and it's as a collective, people work better. You know? So as a collective, in a so if if you if you want to get something done and you're trying to do it yourself, or you have a collective of people trying to do something, you get get it done so much better if you just let other people in to try help you. you know? So yeah, advice is definitely get other people's advice on what you are doing. Even if you are the leading expert in the world at what you do, get other people's advice on how you do what you do. Yeah. Yeah, because there might be someone who's an expert in another field that actually might give you a breakthrough because it's like, wow, you thought about it this way. and Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's your field, yeah. Oh, awesome, Jeff. Well, this has been so much fun and I could talk to you literally for yeah. all night. Um, so what is the best way for somebody to connect with you if they have ideas for the safari name or they just want to say hi, Jeff, or <laughs> what's the best way? So I, I think uh, I'm, I'm not that tech savvy, to be honest with you. Um, I, uh, I do the, the, the biggest way that I think people can see kind of what we're going to do is the Instagram account. Uh, I think Jeff's Jungle. Okay, it's a silly name. I should change it one day. But but I think Jeff's Jungle is probably the best way to do it. Um, I check that quite a lot. And as soon as we put the camp up again, which is going to be very soon, um, hopefully we'll get all that night photography stuff when we can start putting that out. And just so, just so people can see what it's like at night, mm. so we can see what it's like and um, see if people are actually interested in coming out and exploring the dark. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, I'll be more than happy to share those and living vicariously. I don't know. I'm going to get on a plane very soon to back to Africa. Yeah, I or... feel like I can only stay away for so long. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, ideally, we were, we were thinking of doing a, a trip where we would get people like yourself, um, like some tour operators, some really cool tour operators, people like yourself, some conservation minded people to come out and do a trip do a, a test, a dummy trip, where we take people out and we just experiment on you guys like guinea pigs. Uh, we I'll promise we won't pig. get you eaten. But, and yeah, uh, just, just make sure yeah. I don't get some horrible <laughs> bowel something and then I don't get yeah. eaten. Those are my only requests. There we go. <laughs> done, done. I think we can manage both of us. I think we can manage them. <laughs> yeah, just keep me posted. Yeah. Awesome. And we'll give you free beer, which, which talk, speaking of that beer, I, uh, I actually have a, a date with uh, two of those beers very soon. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's been really good to chat to you. Uh, and I'm sure we'll chat again about various things. I'm really interested to, to talk more about that citizen science idea. It's, it's fair and actually utilization of it in what we're doing. That'll be great. Um, yeah, and just fun. Oh, this has been great, Jeff. Mm. Thank you so much. Mm. This has been wonderful. (laughs) Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.